the newly designated, I was going to say crowned, but it's not crowned, designated uh, co-chair for planned giving of the Nord Parish Fund. And the Nord Parish Fund is a uh, uh, endowment fund that was set up almost 20 years ago to manage our assets and also it provides grants every year to multiple ministries within St. John's. So the vestry created the position, asked me to serve in this position as part of the endowment fund. The um, second thing they did was to create something called the uh, Norwood Guild, which has a single purpose, and that's to honor people who make a planned gift to St. John's. In the handouts, if you pick them up, you'll see a quick summary of what the uh, planned giving program is about, an acknowledgement form. If you've made a planned gift, it just gives us some information so we can uh, properly recognize you, uh, easy to fill out. And the third thing is, uh, uh, as a handout, frequently asked questions about estate planning services, which Tom Gentili, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, uh, provided to us. There are also some biographies of each of the speakers. So before um, we proceed, let me do a quick introduction of each of our three speakers. The whole purpose of this is educational, and, and frankly, it's one of the main purposes of the planned giving program, to give people some basis to think about their plans for the future, their legacies, uh, which is another way of describing planned give us, giving, and uh, uh, to get oriented uh, uh, towards uh, how to uh, deal with issues that come up uh, in your life and uh, things to deal with after your life. Uh, the first speaker, I think most of you would know, is Melanie Folstead. Uh, she and Rick have been uh, members of St. John's for a very long time. Uh, Melanie was on the vestry and has served in a number of capacities. She's a senior officer at RBC, the uh, financial firm, and uh, her area is financial planning. The biography is up there. You'll see that she's got extensive training in that subject. The second person is Tom Gentili. Um, he's an estate and trust uh, attorney in the area. Uh, I've known Tom since uh, the 1970s. We went to law school together and uh, graduated the same year. Uh, he actually has done our will and a few revisions to our wills as our lives have changed. Um, he's a, a very fine attorney, but he's also, as with all of the speakers uh, today, a really nice person. <laughs> um, Michelle Primich also fits in the category of a really nice person. Uh, she and Mike and her three, uh, uh, their three wonderful daughters have been members of St. John's for 10 years or so, um, regular attender at the 9 o'clock service. Her area is insurance. She's with Allstate. She runs her own agency, Allstate Agency in Albany, Maryland. Uh, she will be covering uh, some of the insurance options uh, that are available for uh, uh, people who are seniors or planning to become seniors. Uh, if you're in one of those two groups, you'll find that uh, that'll be a, a useful introduction. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Melanie uh, to uh, offer some remarks. I'm going to ask you to hold questions to the end because I've sometimes been in Michelle's position, the last speaker, and as questions come in for the first two speakers, your time gets squeezed, maybe altogether out. So could we hold questions to the end uh, of their remarks? There'll be ample time for them. So Melanie first, then Tom, and then Michelle. Thank you, Earl. Can you, am I on? Did I hit the button right? All right, very good. All right, well, thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So um, as many of you know, uh, my husband Rick and I um, have been coordinating a class here at St. John's over the past two years called Financial Peace University. And I want to pause for just a moment and, and kind of ruminate on that middle word, peace. Um, I think for many people, um, the, the notion of financial stuff being associated with peace is, is rather ridiculous. And in fact, for some people, money is often more, more often associated with the opposite of peace. Um, perhaps when you think about money, you may be thinking about things that are cause stress 
you may be thinking about difficult conversations. Sometimes money uh, also brings up regrets that you don't have more. Uh, for some people, money has even been triggers for relationship problems. So money doesn't always come together with this notion of peace. And I just want to start out with saying if you're thinking or experiencing or familiar with any of that, you're certainly, you're not alone. Um, but I also want to let you know that it is possible to have peace with your financial plan. And I think the real instrumental word there is plan. Um, the biggest contributing factor, in my opinion, with regard to the stress and angst that people sometimes feel in their financial life is lack of control or lack of taking control and not having, not having a plan. As Earl mentioned, my professional hat is that of a CFP. I'm a certified financial planner. And so for the past 25 years, I've been working on a daily basis with people to try and help them bring peace into their financial plans. And I find that even my clients with the most challenging financial situations um, do find calm, <coughs> excuse me, when we just look at a situation and we put it down on paper and we create a strategy for addressing whatever challenges they might be, be, be experiencing. Um, I would say that that planning process is incredibly empowering. It gives us hope and sometimes some assurance and sometimes we even, and I think more times than not, start to feel some excitement about what potentials there, there might be when we handle our money in a very proactive and constructive way. So I'm going to share with you a few ideas that my family and my clients have done in effort to find peace while achieving their financial goals. First thing I would really encourage you to do is have an annual review. And in that annual review, you update your balance sheet. What do you owe and what do you own? And just look at it regularly to make sure that it's tracking as you expect. Make a real commitment to, to just monitoring where your balance sheet sits. After we do the balance sheet analysis, we take a look at cash flow. Um, those of you, I know I've got a couple of my FPU friends in here know that this is something I feel very strongly about, is really looking at where's money coming from and where is it going and taking control of that process. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm married to somebody who is a zealot about this, and so we do maintain a monthly budget, but we also, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we also look at the year, as well as years down the road. And we look at just what's happening on a regular basis, our day-to-day -day spending, but also take into account those things that are a bit more erratic, whether it be car purchases or home renovations, or things that might be finite, such as college tuitions or mortgages. So we kind of get a sense of what our cash flow is going to be looking like for the future. We also then take a snapshot of our investment portfolio. How is it allocated? Is it put together in a way that really reflects our risk tolerance, our comfort level with volatility, and also our cash flow needs? If there's some needs that are coming up that we're going to be needing to tap into it, we want to make sure that those funds are, are available for us to do that. One of the things we do as part of that process is try to be very aware of what tax implications might um, result as a result of when we do the re reallocation. One thing that we've done in the last several years, and I, I really, it's a great tool and, and encourage you to kind of think about, is look for opportunities in your portfolio of appreciated securities that are just prime for gifting to nonprofit organizations. If you have a stock in your portfolio that has grown in value over what you originally purchased it at, just go ahead and gift that to an organization that is a nonprofit. The nonprofit will accept that stock, let's say it's Google, and you bought it for $10, it's worth $20, you give it to the organization, they sell it. They don't pay capital gains. You don't pay capital gains because you're, you didn't sell it. So you get a gift of $20 that you've made to this organization, and they get $20 and no, no taxes. So that's a wonderful tool for you to look at if that's an opportunity that's available to you. Um, the other thing that I do when we do our review, either personally or with clients, is take a look at our debt. What sort of loans do you have? Is there an opportunity for some consolidation? Perhaps maybe some opportunities to refinance to kind of reduce the carrying costs. Again, one of the areas where I spend a lot of time is trying to get rid of debt. I'm, that's one of my pet peeves. I don't like it. So I will spend a great deal of time coming up with a strategy for helping to you to reduce the debt. And then the last thing that usually comes part of the analysis, and I won't spec speak much to this because Michelle will handle this, but taking a look at your insurance policies. And there, are, for most of us, there are quite a few insurance policies that are part of our lives. And you do want to look at them regularly because your needs and, uh, for insurance will change over time and you want to proactively manage that. 
Over the years, as I just mentioned, our priorities have changed. Our plan has been, um, I think having a plan has been really instrumental in making us confident in our direction. And also I think has enabled us to do things that we would not have been able to do otherwise if we didn't have that plan. Now, I'll, as an example, I'm going to talk about some of my very favorite clients. Um, two of them are my parents. Um, I've been working with them as their advisor for many years, which has always added an interesting element to our relationship. Um, when I'm working on their financial plan, their instruction to me is just to make sure there's enough money left over to pay the undertaker for whoever is the last to go. Well, and my response to them is always, can you tell me what day I'll be writing that check? <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier when we have that sort of certainty or confidence in our planning and unfortunately uh, life just doesn't, doesn't cooperate quite that well. So one of the things we do is we put together a plan that should, God willing, leave some remainder. And so when we have those conversations, we talk about what should we do with that remainder. We talk about what's important to them, what legacy they would like to leave, what financial goals they have that extend beyond the date that's going to be on their headstone. Now I'm incredibly fortunate that I have a really open conversation with my parents about this, but I can promise you that not hasn't always been that way, and it takes some time to kind of engage in this type of conversation, and you kind of tiptoe into it. What I found is really important is that I need to be very respectful of them and let them sort of unveil and explore their, their philanthropy and their intentions for their legacy. But I can tell you from experience in working with clients where they haven't had these conversations that not having it can be really devastating. I have seen complications and stress in relationships and damaged relationships and poor decisions when, when these, as a consequence for not having done some planning or engaging in this dialogue. I don't want that for my family and I certainly don't want that for any of you. So let's talk just a minute about plan giving and how it fits into your financial plan. So philanthropy is very important to my parents and they have a few stra strategies in place in order to honor that value. One of the very first conversations I have with them every January is what to do with their RMD. For those of you who are over 70 and a half, that's a familiar uh, abbreviation. RMD is your required minimum distribution. If you have an IRA, you have to start taking money out of it when you're 70 and a half. But one neat feature is you can tell your financial advisor, send whatever portion of that RMD directly to my charity of choice. And so that's what my parents do. Every January 2nd, I don't work on the 1st, but every January 2nd, we talk about what their RMD is and they tell me how much of that to send to their church, how much to send to their other charities. That money now no longer is included in their income for that year. It's not just a deduction, it's actually money that just doesn't exist for income tax purposes. It's a beautiful thing. So if you're charitably inclined and you're doing RMDs, please look into this. Other things that we do is we talk about what's important to them and once they leave what they want to have, what, what they'd like to have done with the remaining assets. A couple of things that are important to realize is your beneficiary designations, life insurance policies, um, although my parents pay, pay say that, that those have all lapsed, but retirement accounts are really prime assets for gifting purposes. Remember, your retirement assets most likely are going to be subject to income tax when you retire, whether you receive that or another person as a beneficiary receives that. But if you designate a charity as a recipient, completely bypasses income taxes altogether. So they're beautiful for passing on to, to, to nonprofit organizations. So in my parents' case, they are each other's primary beneficiary, but their charities are listed as their contingent beneficiaries. And in the case that if my mom passes first and dad says, you know what, I'm, I'm okay, I don't need mom's assets, he can just claim them and just honor her beneficiary designations to those charities. So you've got some really nice options there. Same sort of things with life insurance, life insurance policies if you have them, or annuities. My mom also has an old annuity she bought many, many years ago. It has some growth that's accumulated in it. If she were to take that, or if my sister or I were to inherit that, we'd pay income taxes on that growth. If she puts her church or another organization as a beneficiary, again, it completely bypasses the whole tax implication. Another strategy <clears throat> that my parents haven't used but can make some good sense for others is to a uh, gift annuity. And this takes the form of making a gift to a nonprofit organization who then in turn will make regular payments to you and then ultimately at the end of some predetermined time the gift will then go back to the go back to the organization. So you get a tax deduction for part of that gift but also get the certainty of some income. Which for some people who want to know that they still have some cash flow coming off of that asset can be a really nice my um, strategy. So typically the last part of my conversation with my parents is to review their estate plan. 
Are there any changes that need to be made since it was last updated? Rick and I just updated ours a few months ago since all of our kids are now technically adults. Um, and, it, and a few things have changed in our plans, but it always is good to review it. I can't emphasize enough the importance of an estate plan that is regularly reviewed. It's so important making sure that your wishes are honored and that it can be another really good way to ensure that your philanthropic goals are put into play. So it can take a great deal of stress away from your family and the loved ones so that they will not have to guess about what you would want to have done. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tom, who is going to really good information about plan giving strategies. I'm going to try this without a microphone. I've never liked the way I've done it. So we're recording all the phones. Okay. Don't yeah. speak to the microphone. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Okay. But if you know, I can get it all. I know. It's, it's uh, one, two. Hello. Hi, I'm Tom Gentile. Um, Hold it up, okay. See, I told you I wasn't going to get it back. Um, I, there's a frequently asked questions that Earl had mentioned are on the table. I urge you to get that on the way out. It's good information. Uh, that really summarizes what I'm about to say. Uh, first of all, did you know that there are only two ways to die? You thought there were a lot, right? But as far as a lawyer is concerned, you can die testate or intestate, which means you die having left a will, testate, or die not having left a will, intestate. Some people think erroneously that if you die without a will, all your money goes to the government. Well, that's not true. Uh, each of the states, including Maryland, has sort of written a will for you. It's called the intestate succession statute. But what it does is if someone dies without a will, it essentially distributes their money, essentially to spouse, children, grandchildren, etc. Frankly, that might be good enough for you, but it's not really for most people for a number of reasons. You might have minor children or grandchildren who cannot take money when they're below the age of 18. You might have children who you don't think maybe can handle the money if they're 17, 18, 20, 21. You might want to give gifts to charity, for example, as we've been discussing today, and there's no way that the intestate succession statute doles out money to charity. You might want to choose the person who handles your estate, your personal representative. The old term is executor or executrix. We now use the term personal representative. And you, you might not want the court to choose somebody. You might want to choose that person yourself. To be. So there's a lot of reasons why people would want to have a will. And uh, oh, another one, burial expenses. You probably want your estate to pay your burial expenses rather than members of your family. Well, you can do that in the context of a will. So there's a lot of reasons why people w would want to have a will. Um, when people come in and ask me about wills, they usually ask about a couple other documents, and I'll br just briefly mention them. One is a power of attorney. And a power of attorney is only good while you're living. It's no good after you pass away. And what it does is it gives someone else, usually your spouse or your child or you know, maybe a friend, to handle your affairs if you're not able to do so. For example, you're laid up in the hospital or you're in a, you know, in a nursing home and can't get out. You've designated somebody as your agent to sign papers for you, sign tax returns, file tax returns, go to the bank, etc. So a lot of people do that at the same time they have a, uh, they make a will. Maryland actually has a statutory form for it. Uh, the other document that people usually ask about, they use, use the term living will. Uh, the, actually, the technical name is, it's a confusing term, the technical name is Advanced Directive or Advanced Healthcare Directive. And it does two things. First of all, it designates somebody to be your healthcare agent, not the person who goes to the bank and files your tax return, but somebody who deals with your doctors if you're not able to do so. Maybe you're very sick, even in a coma, whatever. You're designated somebody who can deal with the doctors, authorize procedures, etc. And the healthcare directives also deal with end of life planning. In, a, in other words, it's, I see it as a guide to your family. If you're in a, in a, in a coma, for example, or just gruesome stuff to talk about, but we have to talk about it, uh, or just you know, not much time left to live, it gives a message to your family, do you, do, can you let me go if you want. 
want. You know, let's not use extraordinary measures to take me alive. It's a delicate thing. But once again, people usually ask me about that when they ask about wills and um, powers of attorney. Maryland has a uh, advanced care directive. You can get off the internet and read it over yourself. But I just wanted to mention that. You know, people also ask me about trust because they hear, see, see things in the magazines, the newspapers, the AARP bulletin, radio shows. And so what is a trust? Well, a trust can be a variety of things, and there's a lot of reasons why individuals might want to have a trust. Uh, one of the things that it does is it avoids probate or avoids most of your property going into probate. Probate is a process where you file a will in court, creditors make claims against your estate, there's inventories, appraisals of your property. It's a cumbersome, kind of costly procedure, and a lot of people would like to avoid it or like to have their family avoid it once they pass. Uh, and a, a trust can, can do that in many instances. Uh, people also establish trust if they have children who are young or grandchildren who are young or even older children who they might not think are uh, spend money, would spend the money wisely and they want to keep some sort of control over it. So in a, in a trust, you designate that either during your life or after you're gone, that certain money or property goes into a trust fund. You name a trustee, could be a family member, could be a, a friend, could be an accountant, whatever. Uh, and this trustee manages the property for this beneficiary or group of beneficiaries that you've named. So, uh, a lot of times I get people who have uh, children who have disabilities and they're concerned about you know what happens to their child with disability, even you know, adult children have disabilities and there are certain special trusts that you can make up for children who have disabilities. Uh, the situation is usually that the child, the adult child is usually entitled to some government benefits and you don't want to leave money directly to them so that they don't get the government benefits. You still want them to have benefit from that but be able to get whatever government benefits. But that's a special sort of uh, trust that we set up. Um, I want to mention something about joint accounts and naming beneficiaries on accounts. This is a good idea and it typically avoids probate. In other words, if you have a joint account with your spouse or with one of your children and you were to pass away, those funds go to the survivor. They don't have to go through the probate process. This is good news and sometimes bad news. Uh, for example, mother has four children, husband's deceased, mother has four children. For convenience, she places one daughter on the joint account. Uh, all her money is in this account. She dies, actually that money belongs to the one daughter, not to the other children, because this is the way banks pay out joint accounts. A lot of people think, well, I'll just put in my will that my money in that account will go to all four of my children. It, it, it's meaningless because the bank is going to pay that money to the person who's on the joint account. All I'm saying joint accounts are a good idea in many situations, but be, uh, be careful about you know, how you designate you know, who the payee is upon, upon your debt. Um, IRAs typically we name beneficiaries on when you set up an IRA. Once again, your will cannot control that. The bank is going to pay out to the beneficiary, not to whoever you uh, put in the will. So wills and trusts do have limitations if you have a, uh, if you've named a beneficiary on an account or a, uh, 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 a payable on death beneficiary or a joint account. Okay. Um, The good news is that there is not much left in the way of death taxes anymore. Uh, you, ha you pretty much have to have an estate for an individual north of uh, $11 million or for a couple north of $23 million to worry about death taxes. So I guess that's the good news. Uh, Maryland has a, in, a, an estate tax 
which is at, at five million, although there's been talk of them raising it to the federal level now. So uh, if you do have a, a, a particular tax situation, if you're in that bracket, you ought to talk to a lawyer and accountant about certain ways you might be able to avoid those estate taxes. Whenever somebody uh, obtains something from a trust or a will upon someone's death, uh, it is not taxable. It is not income taxable, shall I say. In other words, you, so you, grandmother dies this year and she leaves you $100,000, that does not go on your income tax next year. It's not a, a, a taxable uh, income for you. Um, however, um, IRAs may well be in a different category. So if uh, you're leaving money, if you're naming a beneficiary to an IRA, this is something you want to look into is about certain ways you can avoid income taxes on those. Um, I'll be glad to answer some questions later or pick up the information about the frequently asked questions and uh, let me know. Thank you, Tom. Um, good morning, St. John's. My name is Michelle Primich, and I've been an Allstate agent for 30 years. Oops. And my part is to speak about the insurance. So a lot of these plans, uh, like Melanie is talking about, and also Tom, are met. Your goals are met with insurance. So what is insurance? Insurance helps protect us from financial loss. It's a form of risk management. When discussing with Earl, our objectives for today, it encompasses making sure that our members of the parish, yourselves, get an understanding of the importance and the methods available to protect you from these type of risks. That's what Tom and Melanie are all trying to, we all want to help you be safe and make sure if you have a catastrophe that you're well taken care of. Beyond the basics of auto insurance, home insurance, beach house insurance, the risks that I help my clients protect against are risks of losing all sorts of things. For example, years or lifetime of earnings. So if you have a spouse that passes 10 years before retirement and they're making 200,000 a year, you've lost $2 million to your state. That's really huge. If he earns more or has more than 10 years left to work, that number can be much higher. So that risk is met through life insurance. We have cash building policies with sub accounts that are mutual funds that will build up a great deal of cash value. These policies often include additional living benefits in the form of a critical illness and a terminal illness rider. So they're really neat. A lot of individuals, a lot of business owners do like to have those. They build up this equity and later on in life if you feel that you don't need them, you can use that equity to retire on. Term insurance is also very good on the other end of the spectrum. They can help cover debts or mortgage security protection is often what it is, is term insurance. So very inexpensively if you're healthy and usually when you get a little bit younger, but on, uh, very inexpensively, you can get 200000 300000 500000 a million dollars in term life insurance to cover your mortgage or to cover your debts. So we have those sort of things. And then what other type of risks are there? Uh, risk of losing your income due to disability. This could be disability from an accident or sickness. And long-term disability covers that type of risk. Or if you're a business owner, risk of losing your business a good deal of your equity in your business if you, one of your partners, or a key employee should pass. So therefore you have at risk there all this business equity you've worked so hard to build up and the risk of that equity not passing on to your loved ones and your heirs. Again, we meet that risk with life insurance, key man life insurance, and funding by sell agreements. Um, backing up on the life insurance too, you can create legacies. And you know, with that life insurance, pass that money on to your heirs, your loved ones, or a charity such as the church. Um, one of my clients, and you can also, backing up here again too, help um, if there's a need that you need to take care of. Like I have a client, for example, who has a daughter, an older daughter with some disabilities, slightly autistic, and they wanted to make sure that later on in life that there would be some income for her. So they set up a second to die policy. So when they have a couple there that's insured, but when the second one dies, that passes on to fund an annuity that's gonna give her a lifetime income. So you can do things like that. You can help create your legacy for your children, your grandchildren, protect uh, children or grandchildren that have disabilities. And one of the last ones I like to mention is another very important one. It's the risk of losing a great portion of your nest egg to long-term care expenses. The US government reports that 70% of people over age 65 will require long-term care services at some point in their lives. 
And as you know, in-home health care can be expensive, but even more expensive is assisted living or nursing home care. We all know people, families, friends of ours that are experiencing this tremendous emotional, physical, and financial toll caring for their loved ones. One of my girlfriends is paying $8,000 a month to pay for her mom's assisted living. So again, that type of expense, you can take care of that by putting this long-term care policy in place that doesn't pass on to your children you know, or your heirs and make sure that that's taking care of that type of burden. Um, not having long-term care in place when needed can cause family disputes or hard feelings when one of the siblings or one of the children assumes a greater share of caregiver duties. And again, because of that huge expense, how large it can be, it can deplete your family savings or require assets to be liquidated, liquid, liquidated to pay for that care. So we broker that long-term care with um, most of the big carriers out there on the market. Genworth, Mutual of Omaha, Lincoln Financial Group, National Guardian Life, Transamerica, and more. Each has different bells and whistles. Mutual of Omaha has an alternative cash benefit once you meet the trigger. Shared care is offered by most, and it's important to have because when you set up long-term care, you have a pool of money. So if you have a joint policy, this husband has may have a half million dollars in his pool of money, depending how you set up the plan, the terms, de determines your pool of money, the number of years, and the whole plan features. And let's say the spouse has another half a million dollars. The shared care enables you to access each other's pool of money because in this situation, who knows which one's going to be sick or disabled and need the in-home health care or the assisted living or the nursing home care. National Guardian Life has a really neat feature in that they have a, in their shared care a third pool of cash. So in that situation, you know, 500,000, 500,000, and another 500,000 to access. So that's really a great feature um, to have. And there's also hybrids out there. Um, Lincoln Financial, One America, and some other carriers offer a hybrid long-term care. It's usually more expensive, but the nice thing about that, it guarantees that the family or the estate is going to re receive the payout benefit in one of three ways either in the form of long-term care benefits, or as a death benefit if you should pass away, or third, a return of premium. So where if after 10 years of paying into the policy, you don't want the policy anymore, you can take back 80% of what you put into it, and with a little more, uh, pay a little bit more premium into the policy, you can endorse that rider where you can actually get back 100% of what you paid into it after 10 years. So the hybrids are really neat, but they are, they are more expensive. So these products kind of fit into Melanie's plan and um, Tom's plans too, and I'll be happy to answer any other questions you have about insurance. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, the hybrids are great. Let's take more spots. Yes. Hi there. Um, my father passed away about two years ago, and when we were doing his funeral, um, they mentioned that it might be a good idea to prepay for my mother's funeral. Is there a benefit to doing that in advance, or what do you recommend? Well, there's a practical benefit in my experience in that the funeral directors usually lock in the, the, the amount. <laughs> so if you pay now and you die in 2028, you're paying 2019 prices. That's the practical benefit of doing that. Second, there's another benefit, and that is that, that it's just some sort of a miserable thing to do a few days after someone dies to go to a funeral director, and they usually want their money up front, uh, and the estate is not opened at that point, so I think it's a great idea. How do you compile information for the death certificate, please? I'm sorry, what? How do you compile information on the death certificate? The death certificate? Yeah. A death certificate you asked about? Um, uh, what happens is the funeral director uh, interviews the family about the deceased person, their date of birth, you know, information of that sort, who their parents were, et cetera, and submits it to the state, and the state issues a death certificate. A lot of times there's some inaccurate information there. Maybe the family member doesn't have this right or that right, and it can be corrected. But obviously it's best to get it done right the first time. I have a comment and then uh, from personal experience and then also a question for you, Michelle. 
Um, the comment is that as I heard you all speak, I remembered hearing similar things at different points in my life and feeling utterly overwhelmed by it. Um, because I was hearing kind of all the different stages and things that need to happen and I couldn't keep all the terminology in my head. But one thing that I, you know, I was thinking as Melanie, you and Tom were speaking and, and Michelle, is that at different stages in my life I had have become, I, I was um, very intentional about tackling one of those things. So for example, uh, with the budgeting, like Melanie, I'm hearing you talking about like retirement and, and also like what do you do with investments. Um, there was a point in my life where I wasn't even keeping a basic budget at home. That hearing about investments was like the last thing I could even have thought about tackling. But it's amazing how like once you have a budget and then once you're like really looking at how the flow of your income works, then you feel like you can tackle the next piece of it. And so really you're infrastructuring it and I, I felt much more interested in that part of it um, because I could hear it that way. And then Tom, uh, you know, before we had our will done, Everything you said would have gone through one ear and out the other just because I would be so overwhelmed. But um, I just want to say like the benefit of sitting down with a will attorney and having them walk you through every piece of it and then you make the best decision you can make and then you don't have to even remember all the details later because you know that it's already down there. And I just, you know, I, I really appreciate it and I, I, like, you know, I don't know how many, it, research says that 40% of Americans have wills, which means 60% don't. And I don't, I, I'm curious how many in this room have wills or not. Would you be willing to just raise your hand if you do have a will? Um, so, um, and, sure designations are shown so that's good. I, didn't, I don't know what percentage that is of the room. Um, but, uh, but the nice thing is that you don't have to remember all of this. There are professionals out there that do this. So my question to you, Michelle, um, we have a term life insurance because we figure at some point in time our kids are going to be old enough they can make their own income. Um, and then we don't have to like be planning for their well-being at that point. But how do you, when you're thinking about what type of insurance to have, always in the back of your mind is that the person selling it to you is going <laughs> to try to sell you the one that's best for them, right. not the one that's best for you. So what is your advice for getting truly the best um, insurance for you without wondering if there's like an ulterior motive or you're not maybe getting the best deal because well, of the agent. Number one, I would say, is this on? Yeah. I would say work with somebody that you trust. I mean, if, the, if it feels being honest with you. I mean, I, I sit down and do a financial needs analysis and we figure out, you know, what type of debts you want to cover. And then um, I lay out both options for people. You know, I lay out the term insurance and then I lay out the cash building policies too. I mean, the cash building policies are nice because they build up a lot of cash value. So you can see, wow, this is really cool. It's building up all this cash value. A lot of people want them, but what's the best policy? A pol the best policy is going to be an active policy that's in place when you pass on. I have some clients that get all enamored with these cash building policies and say, I'm going to put in $750 a month, and then after two years they let it terminate. Well, they should have just gone with something that was going to stay active and, and protect them. Um, Really, we look at, I look at the needs that you're trying to meet and speak with a couple too because I was speaking to somebody earlier and it's also your, spouse, your spouse's decision too, meaning that like when I thought about life insurance on my husband Mike, I wanted to make sure that I had something in place later on in life. So if I had a 20-year 20 20 year term policy on him or even a 30-year term, when he hits age 65, I wanted to have life insurance on him so that if he passes after age 65, in case I needed it to live, continue living in the lifestyle that I was used to living, or help my children, or help my grandchildren one day, I want to be able to have that money. Um, you've probably heard the analogy that having the cash building policies is like owning a house because you build up equity, and the term insurance is like renting because you're not building up any equity. So you have to remember that too, you're putting money into something that you're never going to get back. That being said, they can be super inexpensive. They can meet different me needs. Me being in the industry, I have several different policies. We picked up a million dollars in 20 year term insurance when we started building beach houses in the Outer Banks. And we were down there for 12 years and put up three beautiful houses and bought and sold, bought land and put up houses and made money and lost money. But after that was all done, I just kept that policy because it was inexpensive. For $60 a month, I have another million dollars on Mike. So I'm like, I'm gonna keep that. But I also, for me personally, I want to have a permanent policy. And also, a lot of the permanent policies, and I was talking to Vic about this a little bit earlier, many of them come with a critical illness, terminal illness rider. So the critical illness rider has the same triggers for long-term care. 
So if you can't perform two out of six activities of daily living, you can access 80% of the death benefit. That's a really nice feature too. Um, so to answer your question, I would work with somebody you trust. For me personally, I lay out the different options to people and I want to make sure it's something that they can afford. Melody, maybe you can chip in some more too, uh, pipe in and give some advice on that too, to answer. Yeah, I think Sorry. a lot of what you said is straight on. I, I tend to be, am I on? I don't know if I, um, I tend to be more of an advocate. I'm sorry, you can't hear me? I'm sorry. All right. Um, I'm a term insurance advocate. I, um, and, and personally, I think once you're, you're well, well, I can speak to our own personal situation. Um, the, la the last kid graduated from college last month. The mortgage was paid a couple of years ago. If I die tomorrow, Rick doesn't need my income anymore. My term insurance policy lapses next month, and he's on his own. <laughs> and, 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 he'll, and, and he'll manage just fine. I mean, it, it, the expenses that I was responsible for helping to cover are, are really gone. And so, um, so, and term is just so darn cheap that term it's just, cheap. for most people, I think it's the, the, really the way to go. If you have other needs, I mean, like you were saying, um, you know, if you needed some expenses to be covered later on, I would probably go the investment route as opposed to the insurance route, unless I can make a really good financial uh, argument for it. And, and I look at it, I look at the, the, the whole life policies and the universals, and sometimes there is a, a rationale for it, but I just find most of the time too expensive, so, but. See, but I, and I, but I also, I, I understand that. But even being an insurance person, I wouldn't go without a permanent policy. I like the permanent policy. Okay. I want something later on in mic. So again, in case I need it for my children or my grandchildren, I've got, I mean, if you're very wealthy, you can self-insure. Maybe you don't need these things. But again, also, you wouldn't have to buy the long-term care if you've got a critical illness rider on your, on your so permanent policy. So you can do it both ways. There's different ways it can be met. You know, it's not like just one way to do it. There's actually different ways. See, Melanie and I actually have opposing views so then it comes down to a personal decision I guess. Right? And, and it, it is just looking at all of the options so in the long-term care scenario does a life insurance with the long-term care rider make sense for you or does long-term care insurance and so we I, I'm sorry that to say that it sometimes gets complicated but this is again maybe back to your point yes yeah. finding somebody you trust who really is um, wanting to be your partner in getting your financial goals achieved and finding the best way to do it for you. So. But traditional long-term care one of the things Tom said when I sat down was like he said the hybrids are very interesting because the traditional long-term care if you never meet the triggers you've paid into this and you're not gonna, if you have a heart attack and you die, you pay money into something that's not gonna pay out. Right, because it, it only pays out uh, for that reason. And also life insurance, permanent life insurance can be used for estate planning. Right, Tom? You have to, often you have to use that, so you have to get, you may need to get a permanent policy in force to help make your estate plan work. So that'd be another reason to have a permanent policy. Now that we've totally confused you, sorry. <laughs> I just want to put in a plug for um, Financial Peace University, oh, and I think thank you. Uh, you know it was very helpful to me. I, you know, had got to the point where we in can't retirement I didn't have. I, I was feeling less secure about my my funds, even though I was in pretty good shape. But it, just kind of getting myself back to budgeting, back to paying off debt, back to you know kind of understanding this and doing it with other people in a really uh, non-judgmental way. Um, you know, I've I found it um, very useful, and, and Melanie and Rick were great leaders. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, think about it. Thank you. It, we have a lot of fun, and it's <laughs> and, it, and it's we have a great group of people, and it's it is. It's a, I I like to think it's a very safe environment. We all grapple with financial stuff one way or another, whether we're really struggling or early in our careers or at a different point. We're money stuff comes up and being in a supportive group and having that sort of conversation um, helps you feel not so all alone and you learn some great things. Rick and I learn some great things. I mean, it's, anyway, so thank you. So, so I guess this is a sort of a bizarre question in a way. Um, the high school and two colleges I went to are in my will. But now they're starting to ask, um, tell us when the will was written and how much we're getting kind of is the idea. And I don't feel like telling anybody because first of all, I don't know, you know, but is, does that become a common thing that people are starting to ask what's in your estate and how do people handle that? Right. I mean, psychologically as well as yeah. <laughs> financially. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take that? Uh, so, you know, 
in, in your will, you could leave a specific um, an amount. I leave ten thousand dollars to George Washington University, or you could leave a percentage, or you could leave you know a certain account that you right. You don't know how much is in it. So that part of it, I I know about. Yeah. But what I don't. What what's interesting to me is they're starting to want to know all the details as yeah. if they're going to put it on their because they computer have computer checklist and check them yeah. twenty years and see see what. Happens. They have goals. You know, they want to meet their goals, and so they want to say this is what. So I don't know. You, you don't obviously you don't have to tell them, but uh, I, maybe. De you could answer delicately and say, I, I just don't know. It's probably at least 5,000, 10,000, but leave it at that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't blame either, it. Right? I don't, don't blame you it. You don't have to. I, I, mean, but, there, I mean, obviously, they have to try and imagine yeah. what their cash flow and their, sure, so, it's, so but it is. And you, and you can be very, and, and they know this, you can change your mind. So there's nothing binding about it. So, maybe um, maybe they're looking really for like, yeah, like, is it 10,000 or is it 100,000 or is it half a million? That, that's probably what they're kind of uh, just a roundabout, you know, and, idea. And also sort of an addendum to that is um, you can, you, thank you, um, you can restrict it. So you can say, you know, I, I want to give you this, but I want it to be used for the specific purpose. So you can, um, certainly you've got control, so. I think it's just the putting it down Yeah. Um, I have a short question. When do I get a raise in my allowance? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it to the committee. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, two questions. Uh, first one to Tom. Uh, think about it from the perspective, actually for anyone on the panel, of the heirs. Um, the person has passed away. You're not prepared for this. You think you are, but you're not. Um, and y you now have this thing called estates and trusts and wills and financial plans. Are there things that we can do in our lifetime to make it easier yeah. for our heirs, our family, our loved ones to grasp what we want to know and to understand what is out there in the way of financial resources? I think so, um, and you all can follow me up on this, but one of the things is you, you, gotta, you should have all your information in one place where your heirs, your children, whatever, know where that place is. Uh, I'll take, give an example. Now so many people have their bank accounts, stock accounts online, so they don't get these statements in the mail and their kids or whatever don't even know what the accounts they have. And if they know they got the accounts, they don't have the password. And the, and the stock brokerage company won't give them the password. So uh, you want to share with your executor, personal representative, and or your children, spouse, whatever, exactly what your assets are, what your life insurance policy, who's the name of your life insurance agent, who's the name of your financial planner, et cetera, where they're located, the account numbers, passwords if necessary. So and tell them where they can get this information. One more thing, a lot, I forgot to mention this, a lot of people put wills and other trusts and other information in a safe deposit box, which sounds like a safe thing to do. The problem is, unless your family member or executor is a co-owner of that box, they are not going to be able to get to this box. So you're going to, the person, you die, the person goes, your daughter, whoever goes down to the bank and says, well, I want to get my mother's will because I'm the executor. He says, well, we can only give it to the executor. Well, I'm the executor and it's in the box, but you can't get in the box until you get appointed the executor. So it's a sketch what you do. And you got to call the register wills, they got to get a sheriff, they come down, they drill the box, they get, it's a mess. So if you're going to keep it in the safe deposit box, make sure that you tell that, that that person is a co-owner on the box. Better yet, keep it in a safe place at home. Melanie? Or yeah, the only, kind of, that's all great, great, yes, perfect. Um, what I try to do as part of our, my annual meetings with folks is say, um, you know, at what point do you want to include other people in this conversation and to what extent? And try and lay the, 
groundwork for, you know, is there a, one of your children or all of your children that maybe we can have a family meeting? And you can tell me how much I'm allowed to disclose. I certainly won't say anything that, that I mean, these are your accounts. You, you call the shots here. But the sooner you have that conversation, the better. I always say start early and, and, and early and often, you know, kind of come early, stay late sort of thing. But, and each iteration of that conversation um, helps to advance the dialogue, helps to make sure that you're not running into a kind of a crisis situation and, at a time when you really don't want to be dealing with a crisis situation. So my second question um, is whenever I, I meet with a financial planner, attorney, or insurance uh, broker, the, the one question that lingers in my mind is, have I asked all the right questions? I've asked questions, but have I asked all the right ones? What are the types of questions that you hear, any of the three of you, uh, that people typically ask as they're thinking about um, what to leave behind and how to do it. That's for you. Repeat the last phrase. And how to do it? What to leave behind? And uh, how to to go about doing it? So people asking you questions. I, I care about my children. I yeah. or I have them. Right. Somebody else. What do they ask you? Well, uh, sometimes here's a question: People, have, someone has three children. Three, ch yeah, they have three children, and two of the kids are doing real well. One kid isn't doing so well financially, let's say. And is it okay to leave more than one, more to the, the child who's not doing so financially? You know, he, she's a teacher in a school in the in the inner city, and the other two are stockbrokers or insurance people. <laughs> So what do you do? Yes, you, you don't have to leave things to people equally, but of course this is an individual decision people make. Uh, sometimes there's a question, they ask me how much should I give to charity, and again, I, you know, it's not really a lawyer question, but you, you essentially can do whatever you want. You can be, it's your last chance to be unfair if you want in your will. Um, uh, but th this is something more that the financial planners and the insurance people could, could help you with in terms of how much money you have, how much money you're going to have over time, and whether you should leave in percentages or a flat amount. You, know, you guys got any thoughts on that? Or? You know, I think, um, oh, thank you. Um, it is such a personal thing. I, but probably the question, actually, I had a meeting yesterday and they, uh, the clients were asking me, well, how am I doing relative to your other clients? And it's a great question, right? I mean, I would probably ask the same thing, but it is so varied. I mean, people's needs and experiences and lifestyles are just run the whole spectrum. So I, I can't give a really good answer to that. But I, I oftentimes say, let's just kind of look at what's important to you. Let's, let's look at your budget. Let's look at what's important to you and is how you're using your money in alignment with what's important to you. And if that's the case, then you're probably doing all of the right things. But sometimes when we look at spending and we look at what's important, we see a disconnect. And so this is a great opportunity to just sort of say, okay, wait a minute. My, uh, my restaurant budget was way out of whack with, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Nod is head over there. Um, um, and, and so it's an opportunity for us to just bring our resources back in alignment with our values. And there, that's where I find people find such calm and, and just sort of really helps them to feel better about what they're doing with what they have. I agree. Oh, go ahead. So um, we established the trust about 10 years ago. I mean, we, I think we revised the trust about 10 years ago. So, and I haven't really uh, approached, uh, you know, our, our lawyers since that time. Is that my fault or is that his fault? Right? Which should I be more proactive about uh, doing that? Well, you know, I think every, you should review your will and you should re review your trust. You should review your insurance policies. You should review your investments periodically. I don't know that there's a set time. If there's certain changes in your life, you get a new grandchild or you know, somebody else passes away, it's time to review things. Uh, I also recommend people look at their beneficiaries. Yes. I had a man come in a couple, weeks, a couple months ago, and he had a wife and children, and I asked him about his government insurance policy that he didn't know. He looked it up and he had his mother on there ah. when he served the government. He never went back to review this and, you know, his mother's long deceased, etc. So I don't say there's a set time, but, you know, I, every 
five years maybe, ten years, you, you want to review things uh, just to make sure there's no changes, the law hasn't changed, taxes haven't changed, whatever. Is that right? Yeah, no. So I, I thank you all for being here. Uh, we're at the edge of our time, maybe a little bit over it. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the speakers. I did want to say one thing that uh, in the handouts that you received, the top one has a, a description of the program on the back of it, it's two-sided, is a, a person to contact if you'd like to talk about uh, issues. And that person happens to be me. This must be a typo. <coughs> it gives an email address. It gives a phone number. And also, I tend to be around church every once in a while. You might see me. Mm -hmm. So feel free to catch up with me if you'd like to talk about it. I'd really be delighted to speak with you. I should add, though, that the core team, if you will, consists of, uh, at St. John's on the Plan Giving Program, Melanie and Sari. Sari has been a real catalyst for this. So uh, you can meet with any of us, all with us. Contact me, and we'll work it out if you'd like to speak again. But again, thank you for coming. Your approach, like the way, the way you talk about how you sit down and you do this.